thank you so much for coming in. Um, and this is just a basic, very informal, let's have fun. It's Sunday morning. We're all feeling that way. Yes. Yawn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you guys been enjoying Connecticut so far? So far, so good. Um, I'm, I'm a little jet lagged still. I'll, I'll catch up by like in an hour, maybe. What'd you get here? I got here Friday night. So, I'm still waking up, so good morning. Yeah, things have been fantastic. Also, is this microphone on? No, it's not. It's crazy. It is now. I've got a beach, got my... I would say that everything was going really well until I destroyed that microphone. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> It's okay. It's not your fault. It's okay. They're writing pinky pieces. These microphones suck. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, no, the Connecticut's been uh, amazing so far. Uh, I like Tara got in kind of later on Friday. Got to meet some of the folks. Um, got to spin through the like uh, dealer's arts hall really quickly. Uh, um, just kind of get a lay of the land. Uh, and Saturday kicked off early. Uh, it was a like a really full but really exciting day. Um, uh, the panels that Tara and I did together uh, went really well. The the engagement from uh, folks was was just really. Fantastic! Um, it's great energy in my drawing Pokemon with the professor panel that um, Garth from Star Power joined me on, which was a nice little uh, symbiotic way to have a real artist in with me doing my heinous doodlings. Um, uh, and then, yeah, like I said, Tara and I did a panel after that that was really fantastic. You know, it was kind of Pokemon uh, centric, uh, but like it, it, it went into like voice acting stuff, and we kind of got real a little bit about. Um, you know, some challenges that we've had. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a real treat, like both not only just like meeting people out on the floors, but also the, the panels. That. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Agreed. Second move. All right, anyone here also like to offer their beautiful take or questions or comments? I would love to. Speaking about Pokemon, I, I did not attend that panel. However, I have many questions about the many voices that you guys have played especially with over 50 voices you've done for Pokemon characters. Some of them sound alike, don't I they? Think that's that. true, but it's still, I, I would love to know about the direction that one gets or one is generally associated with when you're doing a voice of something that is based on an animal but not quite an animal <laughs> and very... Well, we're lucky in the way that uh, a lot of the, I mean, the human voices we have more freedom with, but the actual Pokemon, a lot of the, the vocal qualities, they would cast us because we could match what was originally done in the Japanese. So that, get, you know, sometimes restrictions give you freedom in acting. So, so for those, you know, the, the Pokemon themselves, that was a little bit easier. The work is a little harder, but finding the voice was a little easier because we had something to go off of. The human voices, sometimes they wanted it close to the original, sometimes they didn't. So we got to play around with that a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, it was, you know, once you were in the booth and back in the old days of Pokemon, I don't know how it is now, but they wanted to test you and see how much you could do, which was the best way to learn and super fun so, and cost effective for them. Yeah, Tara hit it on the head. Um, maybe more so than a lot of other uh, instances within Pokemon or other shows, um, the Pokemon voices are like something that we often like will listen to the Japanese on and try and take inspiration from that. Um, like, so the, like, like Tara said, uh, sometimes there's uh, more freedom uh, to build one of the human characters. Uh, and for me personally, actually, um, oddly get way more self-conscious about my work as a Pokemon than I do as a human, because I have like so much more confidence that I can communicate clearly as a human character, even if I'm doing different voices um, that are not my own. But like when I like become a Pokemon or I'm doing that thing, like I'm always checking in with Lisa, our director. I'm like, I don't know, did I get that across? You know, like was that really needy enough? Was that hurt enough? Um, it's very funny. I feel like significantly more vulnerable, like acting as a Pokemon than as a human being. You also make fun of your faces. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's embarrassing. I mean, I'd love to have an example of one of those faces for one of the Pokemon. You could pick anyone. Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think what would make it funny. I don't know. I mean, Bulbasaur. I guess I don't do much for Bulbasaur. I bet it's probably harder when you're thinking about your face, too. That's exactly what it is. I have to get out of my yeah. head. But some of them are just dead ears. So, like, you know, my face goes up and I'm like, what do I want? But I don't I try not to care. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, 
<laughs> I legitimately don't know if I can do it because it's early in the morning. Um, and we're not like, nothing that, I'm, is anything that I'm doing right now going to be like on the news? I, yeah. I, I hope we're just, like, just digitally, oh. I know, I hope this is just... Yeah. Like, National like, news. Because it could be like, Jake Page, uh, like, you know, <laughs> epic fails with Jake yeah. Page. Uh, no, because like some of them, I do some of the, 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 the avian types, and uh, those are just like, it's just like screeching for hours. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, and so like, no doubt, I, I joked about this one yesterday, but like, I like doing for a brawler because he did, I might as well be like, chewing a mouthful of rocks on me, like, <laughs> um, and then like, my, my face goes all down, but like, the birds are crazy, like, skarmory is something that, like, and I leave the session just being like, what the was I doing? It's like, <laughs> Um, <laughs> doing that for like, again, imagine doing that for two hours. We have a weird job. Super weird. Yeah. Can I tell a really quick side story about what we're doing? Of course. Um, uh, so we make, for Pokemon stuff like that, like, we'll sometimes be making voices of, again, those aren't like, we're communicating using words uh, that are, are not like, you know, English words, and we like learn how to communicate like that and convey this stuff. Um, so one time I was working on a totally different series that I have for kids. It's a short, short series, like probably eight episodes, so like this little like five or six minute episodes. All the characters uh, were just different shapes, like an octagon, a square, a triangle, and they were all different colors. Um, and you know, like this is one of those things that like I worked at the studio and they booked me and they're like, yeah, so it's this show. I was like, cool, 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 um, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> um, and when I got in there, you know, like you know, we had really like talked about the characters or whatever, but so we, we looked through them and um, they had me voicing I think like three characters and like, okay, so this square, he's kind of like this, you can tell he's kind of like the leader, uh, so like he uses this vowel sound, like this is kind of his vowel sound, um, so let's hear what that sounds like, it's like, it's like, oh, 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 <laughs> and I'm like, cool, yeah, yeah, so we do like an hour of that, I'm like, okay, the triangle, he's kind of like, you know, whatever, like he's a little bit like, a little more timid, and, and I did that, and then we did like the next hour in a circle, and they're like, he's kind of like the goofy guy. And he like this really like, Arr, Arr. <laughs> and so I did that, and I like left there for three hours, and I was like, what the heck did I just do? I just spent like three hours of my life like being like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm gonna communicate, making those incompletely like nonsensical sounds communicating to people, and like someone's gonna consume that and be like, yeah. I thought Ashton Kutcher was gonna jump out. <laughs> be like, this is not a job. <laughs> Show the whole thing. <laughs> They're like, you're a clown. Uh, you thought this was a job. Yeah, we just talk funny all day. Yeah. Do you grow up talking funny a lot, and then you realize, wait, this could be lucrative? I hope to never grow up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I was a singer, so I knew how to play with my voice, um, and I used to copy TV commercials. I used to like just when I was really little. And I would just say them back. So I sort of, I think I was built for this. Um, and then I think I, as I got older, I, I found all the fun high voice stuff, but it wasn't until my first day working on Pokemon, I, you're, sorry to bore you, um, but I saw Veronica Taylor who plays Ash working, and she was doing this amazing little boy voice. And I was like, oh my God, I want to do that. And again, it's like this one little leg up that where women have this extra thing that they've got to, got to get cast in. And um, so I really worked on, on finding that voice. But uh, yeah, I, 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 if you ask my parents, I'm sure they'd say I went around talking funny. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, uh, yeah, like I, 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 I'm an only child. and uh, Yeah. That's why we're uh, so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're so obnoxious. Uh, the, like I grew up uh, like playing with Legos and action figures and like watching cartoons and I was just making all the stories up for myself, you know what I mean? You know, I don't think it's uncommon for kids, even you know, with siblings and things like that, but I guess I'm somebody that just like kept doing it into their teens and twenties and I didn't stop and like, you know, I got into acting and then, you know, friends and colleagues like knew that that was like something that you know, like I, I would even when I made like short films with my friends back in like high school or college, we'd still do like little like stop motion things with people, and I would do the, like with like figures or something, and I would do the voices. You know, so something I was always really passionate about it doing, and it, it didn't occur to me until honestly to like I was wrapping up school, but I was like, oh yeah, there's like a market for some of this. Like you know, people are like oh we're like uh, yeah. you were considering <laughs> commercial voiceover, and I'm like not until now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so like I grew up just like doing it my whole life. I have a follow-up on that. Is there a was there a watershed event in either of your lives, or a mentor or a person who kind of 
open that first door for you? And how did, how did that come about? I, I was really lucky. I was 16 and I was at a local singing competition at the Y. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's like such a cliche. I live near Manhattan, near New York. I'm born in Hartford, right. but I grew up in New Jersey. And um, and uh, I was in, this, in the, this talent manager. I mean, it's just so cliche. He was like, hey, kid. Um, and she brought me into her office and then she said, do you want to go on a voiceover audition? I said, what's that? <laughs> And she said, just get on the phone with this, this person. And I talked to them. They go, OK, she has a good voice. And I went to an audition for a wart cream commercial, <laughs> where I said something like, ew, gross and wart. <laughs> I've been doing the same job. I've been doing the same job since I was 16 years old. I was a talent manager. I know about this wart cream commercial. And I was like, I just saw the perfect well, <laughs> well, she didn't know that was coming up. I was at like a general informational. And she had seen <laughs> that wart <laughs> This girl hates warts. Yeah. So yeah. So she was like representing me for a theater and all this stuff. But that happened to be the first audition she sent me on, and I got the job. And my mother's like, I have to drive into the city. <laughs> Wait, they're paying you for that? Great college. Like it was, you know, that was the thought. But for my parents, they're like, we'll happily drive you in if, if they're going to pay you to say gross award. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, this could be a job. And that, you know, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's awesome. I um, I guess I'll try and race really quickly through kind of my origin story. I guess if that if that helps answer that. Um, yeah. So like I, yeah, like I was um, I went to school to be an actor. Like as soon as I got to New York City, I was like doing everything that I could. I was doing a lot of like uh, like like indie film stuff, and uh, I was doing this like sketch uh, comedy video piece, and I was just, like sitting by the craft services table. <coughs> Um, you know, just eating some carrots or something like that, and uh, the producer came over to me. Sure, it was candy. It was a Snickers bar, just cramming them in my face. Um, <laughs> That'll give me uh, warts. What's that? That'll give you warts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ew. <laughs> yeah, I had not there yet. I didn't know how to fight the warts. Um, and the, one of the producers came over to me and was like, we we're just kind of chit chatting. They're like, hey, you know, what are you, um, what are you working on, uh, like right now? And oddly enough, like I told you about those little stop motion things I did with my friends. And as soon as I graduated college, one of my buddies that had been making films with my entire life, like uh, we decided to make like a little short, like five-minute cartoon. They had made an animator friend, and like they reached out to me. They're like, "Hey, you know, we want to collaborate with you as a writer, but would you want to also like like try some voices for it?" So I sent them some voices, and they were like, "Heck yeah!" Um, and so we were doing that. So I told them, "But well, actually, you know, I'm working on this this like uh, animated short right now uh, with some of my friends, and it's like it's really fun." Uh, it was the only animation thing I'd like, ever done. I'd done like some like light commercial voiceover, but it was very much just getting started. Uh, and like a year later, I got an email from Rod of the Blue, uh, the producer, and she was like, hey, are you still doing voiceover for, like, for cartoons? And I was like, yes. <laughs> um, like, I, yes, I, yes, we, I, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so she's like, cool, I started working uh, with this studio, would you want to come in and audition? And I was like, heck yeah. So I went in there, and then uh, this kind of circles to your question, like, did you have kind of like a moment where you're like, this is the moment? I was like super excited, because again, this is something that I enjoyed and was passionate about. You know, I was a fan of uh, not only cartoons, but anime, so this was like, really exciting. Um, and I got in there, and you know, bringing confidence into an audition is kind of essential. You know, like, I, I don't, I, I hope that I never come across as an arrogant person, but you do have to bring some confidence in there. And so I was like, hey, I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna represent myself, I'm gonna tell what I'm doing, I'm gonna keep a positive attitude. And I sat across from this director uh, and he like asked me what I was what I like had done. I was like, oh, I did this like, you know, this cartoon like this, and I did like this olive oil commercial. And he's like, cool, that, that's not what we do. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Uh, and he was a bit of a uh, uh, hard case. Uh, and so he kind of like, like looked around and uh, he took this piece of paper out with like a list of like 20 cues on he slid it towards me and he pointed a poster at the wall and he said, that's that guy, go for it. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and so I just like, I just started, like I like picked a voice that might make sense for that character and I started going down the cues, which again, for anybody that's seen like a, a script for an animated program, like you don't, it's not a script, it's just like lines, you know what I mean? Like your character's lines, which might be totally out of context, they might be 15 minutes apart, you know what I mean? You've got no idea what they're related to. And I was just going at it. And uh, like halfway through the page, he like takes the paper away. He's like, okay, okay, okay. He's like, that wasn't awful. Um, 
Uh, we chatted a little bit longer, but I walked out of that like pretty shook, and I was like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about working in cartoons or animation. Yeah. Like, I, 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 can, I, I don't have to worry about that. Um, but a week later, that producer reached out to me and said, hey, um, the director, you know, um, would be interested in bringing you in for like a short Walla session, if you'd be interested, which Walla is kind of like background, uh, like filler voices, like, hey, we should go to the party. I'm like, I don't want to go to the party yet. Yeah, it's really fun. We should go to the party. Um, doing that. And so they brought me in for that. I did like two Walla sessions with them, and that was like the very beginning. Like through that, I actually met a bunch of the people that I still work with at like different studios all across the city and the country. Um, but it, that, that was the origin. It was not like a meteoric rise by any means. Like it started there. Um, so I'm sorry I, wrote, I, I went on so long with that, but that was uh, like. It, it, it's a lot, Tarot probably creates a lot of tiny moments, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like a choice to pursue acting, it's a choice to take a risk, it's a choice to have that dialogue, it's a choice to be at the craft services table without your headphones in so <laughs> someone can talk to you. Right. Um, anyway. no, that's good. I'm looking for, uh, so I work with college students, what other advice do you have then? Because those little moments are sometimes hard to create, but when you're ready to take advantage of them when they come up, then you can start down a path. Yeah, it's being it's being ready when they come up and not being scared and saying yes and trying everything. You know, I always say when they showed me Bulbasaur, they were like, "Hey, this little green guy makes this noise. Can you do that and say Bulbasaur?" Yes. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, luckily, it worked. There's times it doesn't work, and I, he was talking about this yesterday. You know, being afraid to fail is not being afraid to fail. Sorry, that's that would be the opposite. Um, taking chances and you know looking silly and having a sense of humor about yourself and about your work and not taking any of it. So, I mean, look, we're playing pretend. We're, we're grown-ups talking funny all day. We're very lucky to do this. Uh, so having a sense of humor about it, being ready to go with the flow and all that. And then when that opportunity does arise, you're ready and you meet it. And again, training and all that, all that, all the obvious stuff comes into play as well. Yeah, this is 100% echoing what Tara said, but uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Quote I can remember. That's good. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and I think an important thing too, if you're talking to anybody, like students or otherwise, that are like trying to get um, a leg up or get uh, get going in any industry, is that if you think about that phrase, um, uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity, there's only one of those elements that you actually control, which is preparation. It's so, like, the, it's the part of it that you can focus on right. is like, your work, your in your dedication, your focus, and stuff like that. Um, you know, I will say that this industry is a lot of hustling. Some people like it's not their speed, and I get it. You know what I mean? Like, like being quote unquote successful in the industry might mean racing around a city to five auditions in a day, spending six hours commuting um, for things that you don't book any of. And that's, that's, that's successful because like you're in those doors, you're in those rooms talking to people and that's like more than half the battle yeah. right. is, is being there and having those opportunities. So, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about now that this is sort of your craft and profession, how do you take care of your voices when you're screaming like a bird for two hours? Yeah. <laughs> uh, sleep and water. There's, there's a limit to really what you can do. You know, I finished a video game session the other day and I just went home and went on vocal rest. Because there's not, you know, I have the best voice doctors in LA, but they'll tell you, if you don't shut up, there's nothing I can do. You know, there's certain medications, obviously, that can help if you're really in bad shape. But, it's and it's also speaking up for yourself. I've been in some, some really difficult sessions where the director wanted to push me to, to do certain things and I've had to say, I need to take a three minute break and not talk for three minutes and uh, then I'll be fine. But And, and I've had directors say no. It's been interesting. Um, I've, I've almost really ruined my voice once like that. Uh, smart directors will save all of your really difficult stuff for the end of a session. Um, you know, this week I have, they said, do you want to do all of this work in, in four hours or do you want two two hour sessions? I said, two two hour sessions. If you can, um, if, you, if you can, if they're if they're accommodating, it's, it's being an advocate for yourself, which is not easy to do. Like I, it took me a long time to speak up for myself. Um, but vocal care, I mean, and the truth is, you can really look online and find great ways to take care of your voice. There's like exercises with straws and warm ups, and warm ups are huge. I mean, I sing in my car the whole way to a session just to get it going. So that, because a lot of times we don't know when we get there what we're doing. Yeah. 
That was a loose idea. <laughs> Not, I literally went to a thing the other day and it was, a t I thought it was a game and I thought I was going to be a bad, you know, tough chick. And they wanted her to sound like this the whole time. So luckily I sung Hamilton for an hour in my car. And I was ready to go, but. <laughs> Yeah, Tara, Tara had a great point there. Uh, scheduling is actually like a big thing of it for me. You know what I mean? Like trying to make sure that, like you said, if you can do a two and two, you, you can schedule that and they allow it, depending on the voice type. Like that's super helpful. Um, a lot of it, it is kind of <laughs> like constant awareness. Um, I just think about this because it was just last night, but um, uh, David Sobolov and I were like out grabbing food and we, we couldn't find a place that didn't have live music playing. Ugh. And like that's honestly as funny as it is, it's like beautiful, we're all artists, we love music, but like we, we you can't talk in a place with live music. We, we couldn't, we're like, okay, well, we'll eat this food and we'll enjoy this experience, um, but we will not be speaking to each other. Um, it ruins your social life. Yeah, because yeah, you go to like we we it's like you go to a birthday party. You've got a session based for me. If I got a session like before noon, basically the next day, if I go to a birthday party, I'm this guy. <laughs> We're so annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Like exactly. And you don't want to be that jerk, but. Yeah. yeah. And then another Still one. Still go. Yeah. <laughs> like Terry said, there's like a bunch of like. There's a million things and people like learn what's best for their voice. I'm probably like at least in New York known as kind of as the siren guy. Like even here, like I think Malcolm is my uh, my helper over there, um, has probably heard me many times just walking around and I'm like, I'm this guy. That's me all day. I'm trying to make sure that like my high end is still there, like because it's like an, it's like a check engine light for my voice. Like if I start feeling that I can't go up there, like I know that I've either been shouting or talking too much or unsupported or whatever. And so like I try and keep that like loose and open. And again, I'll do it on the train, I'll do it on the street, I'll do it walking through the convention. If you look at me and think I'm crazy, it's because I am. Where did you guys find that? Did you do that through your teachers, or did you just find it over time with experience, just kind of making different sounds, or that sort of like thing that you do? Teachers, yeah. Teacher? I mean, any time you take a, vo a vocal class, they'll teach you warm ups. They shift their good. Yeah. Were there any voices or characters you did as a kid that you thought, oh, maybe I do have a bit more of a range than most people are? Ooh. No. <laughs> no, um, honestly, like, uh, <laughs> I, I, I still don't know if I necessarily consider myself with an incredible amount of range right now. Like, I might play a diversity of characters, but, like, there are many people that do high-end stuff, like, way better than me. Like, I may have voice like Peter Pan, I'll voice young kids. Um, and, like, I play uh, in Yu-Gi-Oh! right now, I play uh, Yusaku, uh, and I also play uh, young Yusaku uh, during, spoiler alert, you know, some sequences where you see them like that. Um, and those are all high, but again, I, I, I wouldn't like be probably personally putting that as like the top of my resume. Like I have friends that are awesome at it, and I will audition for that stuff when the directors think I'm right for it. And if I book it, like I'm stoked to do it. Uh, but again, I don't ever go like I'm the high end guy, you know. <laughs> you mentioned before about sort of the difference between uh, playing characters that are have more of a restriction because play like anime characters and so they want to match voices. What, what do you think that is your difference in terms of mindset going into something where you have a lot of free, a lot, a lot of freedom for the characters in terms of like being able to do whatever you want, essentially? It's like I said before, like sometimes that freedom, you don't, I, I like the restrictions sometimes. Although, for the most part, if it's, if it's new animation and it's not to, to picture and all that, you're lucky to be working usually in a, with a group of actors, which is the best thing we can hope for. I mean, that's the dream. You, you don't really do, you don't study acting to sit in a booth by yourself. You know, I, mean, I didn't. I love when I can work with other actors. So for that reason, once you're starting to play off of those people, the character comes even more to life and it's even more helpful and you have a voice director there, luckily. Um, a lot of the trick is like, you know, I work on a lot of Barbie stuff and the biggest trick there is not sounding like the other girls. So, you know, we're constantly adjusting our pitches just so they're like, oh, no, she sounds, no, you're sounding like Barbie, you're sounding like, you know, which is such a weird problem, but, you, you know, when there's 10 girls on a show, you can't all sound alike and you don't all have accents. Like, that's the, the easy way out. So it's finding the voice, but sometimes it's really, like, so out of your control. You know, they're like, make it raspy because you sound like her. So, again, ready for anything. Yeah, I, I really like, um, being able to like if I have a wide open 
uh, like palette or creative space, I do enjoy that a lot. Um, I think because I, I like being able to do stuff out of left field sometimes. Um, you know, and when it comes to auditions, it, it's a, it can be a blessing and a curse because if they like, hey, we really don't have anything like set in stone for this, so kind of bring us like three really diverse options. I like to go crazy, you know what I mean? And that might mean sometimes that they just wanted somebody, they, they might have literally just wanted my voice, but I never gave that to them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, because at like a, a, a time that that was rewarded, like one of the you know again few times that I can remember that is I was working on this show called Super Four, which is um like the Playmobil animated show, and um, they had this little robot buddy of one of the main characters uh, that I auditioned for, and they didn't really like necessarily have anything like they were like yeah like, give us like a robotic voice, but then give us like a couple like just totally different things, and so I did like a super like old man voice like well Gene we should probably go. Um, and they went with that, they're like, yeah, it was the old man robot. Um, so he's this little, like, robot that follows behind, he's like, gee, we should probably leave. Um, which is funny, you know what I mean? Like, we all expect it to sound, you know, like, like, r 2 d or like, some kind of, like, it is time to leave, Gene. You know what I mean? Except he sounds like an old man. And so every time he talks, we're like, like, that's that, why does he sound like that? Like, and it gives us so much thought about, like, the character, like, is this an old robot? You know what I mean? Like, what's the story here? Um, anyway, so that was, like, a fun circumstance where, being able to just uh, start from scratch was, was really rewarding and fun. Just out of curiosity, um, what are the rules for voice actors in the booth, um, in the studio? Like, can you guys go over eight hours, six hours, or just like really short? It depends on the uh, union rules. Uh, so with the new video game contract, there's a vocal stress. I can't remember the exact amount of hours, but we are protected in certain ways. Um, if you're working with a good group of people, they'll tell you if something's going to be vocally strenuous, uh, which is great. For audiobooks, I work long, long days, wow. and I'm just prepared for it. Look, I probably could ask them to split it up, but I have to be ready to work crazy long days. Um, Do you finish a whole book in a whole session? Oh gosh, well, it depends how long the book is, honestly. Um, you know, if I'm doing, I can usually get, if a, uh, the, the rule is like, Mm -hmm. Two hours in the booth for every hour of finished audio you hear. Yeah, two to one. So two to one. Yeah. So if I'm, I usually, if on a good day, I can get three and a half hours done if I have an engineer and everything. Oh wow. That, and that's that's a lot. Yeah. That's me on a really good day. <laughs> so there's there's no rule necessarily about that. It's sort of what you can handle. But the more efficient you are, the more you're probably going to work. Okay. But most animation sessions, like for any of the mainstream shows you watch, uh, new animation, they're four hour sessions. Four hour sessions? Yeah. Yep, I'd say like four is pretty common. Um, uh, as Tara said, there are different like union rules. Um, and then after that, it does kind of loop back to what we talked about earlier, which a little bit has to do with your relationship with your directors and your studio and the producers and such. Like if you can communicate what you think is really possible for this. Um, like David Sobolov probably has some great uh, insights on this as well because he plays some really vocally demanding characters. And uh, he, he probably, you know, depending, either he has to power through sometimes and lets, like, is able to communicate to the client that that means, you know, we can't do that every day, or, you know, going like, hey, I can only do this for an hour or whatever. Um, so being able to have that dialogue is pretty essential because, you know, um, when I do my voice acting panel, I talk about this as well, but, like, it's, it's voice talent have to be really careful about. Uh, I think it's something you learn fairly early on because it can, it can uh, shoot you in the foot. Is that like you really don't want to audition with something that you don't know you can do? So like that's a perfect scarring, and then I'm like, well, you only get two of those, uh, <laughs> you know? Um, so you have to be careful because you might only get one shot. Like if you did that, um, and say like in a vacuum, if some voice talent did that, like brought that in and they brought you in for scarring, and you could only do it twice, and your and your voice got weird and blown out, and then it dropped down. Um, you know, they, they're hopefully they'd be like nice, but they might not like reach up to you again in the future because that was I get cost time, money, frustration, that type of stuff. And again, I'm, I'm, this is all hypothetical. I'm not saying if, you know, I'm not saying the Pokemon company would do this. I'm putting this in a hypothetical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for voice talents, you need to be careful about that type of stuff. Cool. Thank you. You ever have any instances like I know some of the video game industry companies do this, where an audition they give you like the littlest information. And then after you get it, like, oh, hey, we're working on this. Because I know, like, the main GTA cast, they weren't given a head, but they didn't tell them anything about it. And then after they got it, like, oh, you're working on GTA 5. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was another thing we addressed, actually, in the new video game contract, that we get some disclosure. But in the auditions, everything has a code name. So when we get the audition, we have 
no clue what it is. We can dig around, like sometimes there's context clues, um, but there's many, many times that I'm very excited to find out what I'm actually working on. Sometimes I never find out what it is until someone tells me and it's been released. Happens often. Anime, anime. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I was recently credited in a game I wasn't in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I, they had tried to book me and I was leaving town and then somehow I ended up in the credits anyway and I had to disappoint a lot of people by telling them I wasn't in it. Um, Who's the one to tell you that? Well, someone congratulated me on it, and I said I never worked on that. But it had a code name, so I had to go back and like really figure out if I had worked on it. Like, it's very strange. Anime is much more um, transparent. We, we usually know what we're working on. Yeah. So, that's, that's nicer. Speaking of what you talked about before, uh, we, should, we had the opportunity to speak to David in the interview process on Friday, and we, I got your insight on something that he was talking about, which is that range changes over time as you're working in the industry. Do you guys think that there's uh, those exercises that you were doing or anything? How do you think your voices have changed over time since the beginning of working? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, for me personally, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, like I don't, I wouldn't consider myself the high end guy. You know, I, I, I would still say though, I bet um, that my voice has like shifted down a little bit. You know, um, I voiced Peter Pan something like three years ago now. Um, and I haven't had to pick it up probably in a year or a year and a half. Maybe I haven't had to, had to do any pickups or additional cues or episodes or anything like that. Um, and I would bet again, like if I if I went to go do that, you'd either take a while to warm up, or it might legitimately like not quite be where it was three years ago. Peter Pan um, grew up. Hmm? Peter Pan grew up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. You know, I don't know if that's just like a biological settling of the voice, or if it's like a from. Use. I'm, I'm not. I'm actually going into the full biology of it, um, but yeah, I, I think that my my high high end of some of that stuff, at least when it comes to like speaking voices, like might slowly make there be like a, a slight curve there. You know, and we'll find out. Like, let's circle back at um, yeah, uh, Canadian Con uh, in like 2040, and let's see where it's going. Like, <laughs> yes. yeah. Old man How robot. Now? All the time. Who's your before and after? Yeah, we'll see. We'll check my scarmory. We'll check the tape, yeah. and we'll be like, play the scarmory, no, do scarmory again. Ah, that's nerve-wracking. Can you talk about the, is there a percentage that you can identify of auditions you go on yeah. versus jobs you get? Oh, boy. Not versus, anymore. <laughs> versus the, your dance card's full enough that you just get called in for, for work. Uh, and how long did that take over your career so, so far? I mean, I don't think we'll ever get to stop auditioning. And, and when that happens with those like direct jobs, which does happen a lot, it's not usually the roles that you're gonna be asking me about. It's usually you know the smaller stuff, which is I'm thrilled to do and happy to do. But for anything big, we're gonna still have to read on it. The ratio used to be easier to figure out now because of the, the way auditions work. I mean, everyone is auditioning for everything because we have home studios and used to go to an audition and it was whoever was at that audition in New York. Yeah. That's who it was. If there were 25 girls there, Look at them. now it's 2,500. You know, commercials have gotten incredibly competitive yeah. and celebrities are happy to do them. So, you know, how many times do I read a commercial and then I'm like, oh, well, Tina Fey did it. Why did I read for that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Why didn't they just call her? Which they probably did and she was like, I don't know. And then, um, she got some free, free time on a Thursday. Yeah, she's like, I'll do it. Um, I love her. I'm not dissing her, but celebrities have. So it's it's the numbers game. It used to be a lot easier to figure out. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, uh, the ratio is um, is uh, statistically actually. You know, there was a while um, that I was thinking about doing a uh, a math of acting panel. Um, <laughs> Which <laughs> I think it might just be a little too dark. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Because for anybody like, uh, and I do think there should be more of these in colleges. There should be like, a, you know, people have like, you know, career prep classes and like uh, things like that. But I do think like a hard statistics class would be would be really powerful. Um, for and it should probably come like your third year of college or so, like right as you're on the point of like where there's no turning back. You know. Um, because the math of acting what? is pretty terrifying. Um, it's called the business of acting. Nope, yeah, the math right? of acting. What was that? Trying to drive away the competition? Yeah, that's my goal. 
yeah, yeah. I'm very nefarious, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm being transparent and honest, but it's really evil. Yeah. <laughs> On that fantastic note, oh, that's an hour. <laughs> Thank you.